Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the first week of class during which we covered introductory material. In this and next week, we will cover the fundamentals of two-dimensional signals and systems. We are interested in describing some important and useful signals. One of them, as we'll see, the complex exponential is the building block of any signal. And we're also interested in the input-output relations of systems. This week, we will carry this discussion in the spatial domain, while next week we will move the discussion to the frequency domain. We use two-dimensional signals and systems in our presentation. However, all the information we provide is also applicable to one-dimensional signals, but also to higher-dimensional signals, that is, multi-dimensional signals in general. We will become now more specific and talk about important 2D signals, the ones we encounter often, and systems that process such signals. We're primarily interested in the algorithmic or the mathematical or the software implementation of such systems in this course. We will then move on a specific class of two-dimensional systems that have two important properties, that is their linear and time invariant, or specially invariant. Such systems are very useful and popular for processing images and videos, and they're friendly in the sense that they allow us to describe them in a succinct way in the spatial domain through their impulse response, but also allow us to look at their behavior in the frequency domain. This week's material forms the backbone of any course on multidimensional signals and systems. Equipped with the knowledge you'll acquire this week, you'll be able to understand any paper or work that deals with the processing of signals in any dimension. If you already have had a course on an one-dimensional signal processing, then the material I'll be presenting here these two weeks will reinforce your knowledge on the topic. We will simply add one independent variable to our signal representation and will take everything from the one-dimensional line to the two-dimensional plane. If this is the first time you are exposed to this material, don't be discouraged if everything is not clear right away. It might take some time and experience for everything to sink in. We'll be utilizing some of these ideas throughout the course, so by the end of the course everything should become much clearer. I will clearly be presenting only basic material, which will be required for the remaining of the course. For those of you interested in this specific topic, there is a plethora of books and resources that will allow you to look deeper into the topic. In this first segment, we'll introduce some conventions in representing 2D and 3D spaces, and then we'll introduce two basic two-dimensional signals, the unit impulse and the unit step we will see that both of these signals are separable signals. So let's proceed with the material of this second week. Let us first establish some notation and conventions when we deal with 2D and 3D discrete signals. Let X, N1 and 2 be a two-dimensional signal. N1 and 2 are the independent variables. They're integers, they take values 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2. And mathematically speaking, a signal, an image, can be can have infinite support. That is, the values that n1 and n2 take are between minus infinity and plus infinity. When it comes to the orientation of the axis, I can use n1 as the horizontal axis and to the vertical one with this orientation. That's how we're used to representing functions in calculus. So here is 0, here is the point n minus 1, here is the point m minus 1. So this is an n by m image. So if this is n1 prime, this is n2 prime, then here is the pixel with coordinates n1 prime and 2 prime. The value of the pixel is in general a real number. 
Now, drawing from the way matrices are represented on the computer, I can pick the N1 axis this way and the N2 axis log on like this. So, in this case, um, if I pick the same N1 prime, it will be here, approximately here. The same N2 prime will be approximately here. And therefore, this is now the pixel with coordinates N1 prime and 2 prime. Clearly, as long as the orientation of the axis is known, the result of processing an image should be identical. It shouldn't matter uh, which way I have uh, chosen to represent the axis. When I deal with color images, then there are three channels involved, the blue, the green, the red channel. If these channels are added up, I end up with a color image. So if this is the N1 axis and this is the N2 axis, Again, the location, the N1 prime and 2 prime location of the pixel will be the same, the pixel at the same location, X, N1 prime and 2 prime. But the difference now from the previous cases is that X, N1 prime and 2 prime is now a vector, a 3 by 1 vector, where I have the value of the red channel at this location, followed by the value of the green channel at the same location, follow the value of the blue channel at the same location. Okay, so the RGB representation, so X therefore in the general representation can be a scalar or can be a vector. When I deal with Three-dimensional discrete signals, then X N1 and 2 and 3 is the representation. N1 and 2 and 3 are integers. And again, mathematically speaking, they can range from minus infinity to plus infinity. So here is a collection of frames representing a video. So I can choose N1 going down this way. N2 is the second axis and N3 is the third axis. It represents discrete values of the time domain. And now an X, N1 prime, N2 prime, N3 prime would be a pixel. Let's say if N3 prime is here, it will be a pixel in this frame with the other two coordinates, n1 prime and 2 prime. It's a bit hard to exactly represent in this case, but you do get the idea. Let us now talk about some specific signals that we will be making use of in this class. The first one is the unit impulse, will be denoted by delta, n1 and 2, and by definition is equal to 1 when the arguments are equal to 0. So if I'm here on the 2D plane, here is N1, here is N2. Then I'll denote the delta like this, and the height of the delta equals 1. I can shift the delta around, so I can write delta N1 minus N1 prime, N2 minus N2 prime, and then according to the definition, it's equal to 1 as long as the arguments are equal to zero and zero otherwise. So from here we see that it's zero when n1 equals n1 prime and n2 equals n2 prime. So again, if I'm to sketch it, depending on the values of n1 and 2, I have not restricted them, so Let's say N1 prime is here and N2 prime is here. Therefore, in this case, I have a signal like this. So it's a delta, it's the value is one and it's zero everywhere else, everywhere else on the plane. I can talk about a three-dimensional delta by introducing an N3 there. 
So the definition will extend to B1 when N1 equals N2 equals N3 equals 0. An interesting notion is the notion of separable signals. A signal G is separable if it can be written as F1, which is a function only of the one variable, N1, times a function F2, which is a function of the second variable only. Uh, the question then is whether the 2D delta is a separ separable signal, and the answer is yes. Um, we can, if we, let, let's look at it pictorially first, right? If I have a signal that looks like this, so it's a line of deltas, so it's one on the vertical axis and zero everywhere else, and all these values are equal to one, right? And then if I have a signal that has a line of impulses on the horizontal axis. So the solid dots here all have value of 1, and the signal is 0 everywhere else, right? So now if I multiply these two signals, then it should be clear by just these pictures I'm drawing here that I multiply like this one is multiplied by a zero here this one is multiplied by a zero over here this one is multiplied by a zero at this location and it's only this one here at the origin that is multiplied by one here and therefore the result is just this signal which of course it has we have defined it this is delta n1 and 2 now what is the first signal equal to this is a delta N1, right? Because this is, by definition, equal to 1 when the argument is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. But I'm on the two-dimensional plane, right? So delta N1 is 1 for N1 equals 0 and any value of n2, no restriction on n2. So therefore um, n1 equals 0 on the vertical axis. n1 equals 0 here, n1 equals 0 here, 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 here. So this line of impulses, the first one is represented by this, mathematically by this function, delta, delta n1, and similarly this line of impulses is a delta n2 signal. Therefore uh, delta N1 and 2 can be written as delta N1 times delta N2, and it is therefore separable according to the definition, right? So delta N1 takes the place of F1, N1 in the definition, right? So this, I'm rewriting the definition here, times F2, N2. Another useful function is the discrete unit step. It's denoted by u, and by definition it's equal to 1 as long as the, its arguments are non-negative. So n1 is greater or equal than 0, n2 is greater or equal than 0. So if I'm to sketch it here, is again 1 as long as n1 is greater or equal than 0 but also n2 greater or equal than 0. So the values of the solid circles is are 1 and then this signal extends from 0 to infinity in the n1 direction and 0 to infinity in the n2 direction. Um, we often label the quadrants. This is the first quadrant. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. And in this case, we say that the discrete unit step has support in the first quadrant. We can shift the unit step function around. So if I have 
n1 minus n1 prime, n2 minus n2 prime, then by definition this is equal to 1, as long as its arguments are non-negative. And 0 otherwise. So from here we see that n1 is greater or equal than n1 prime and n2 is greater or equal than n2 prime. So if I'm to sketch this shifted step depending on where n1 prime and n2 prime are located, so let's say n1 prime is here and n2 prime is here right so then the shifted step function looks like this and extends to infinity this way to infinity this way so this is the coordinates of this point is n1 prime n2 prime the next question is whether the unit step is separable as was the delta and the answer is yes so u n1 n2 can be written as u n1 times u n2 and pictorially u n1 is 1 as long as n1 is greater or equal than 0 so it looks like this again the solid circles have value 1 so it extends to infinity this way and this way and this way right so this is u n1 u n2 is the signal that is 1 as long as n2 is non-negative so it will look like this right so it extends this way this way this way to infinity so this is u n2 and clearly if I multiply these two signals then what I'll end up with is the unit step right so it's going to be non-zero only in the first quadrant so this is u 